Turn, t- turn in your Bibles to uh, the book of 1 Samuel. Turn to chapter 1 of 1 Samuel and take your Bibles and let's stand up and in honor of the Word of God as we read verses 9 through 18. There you go. You remember that, what that's about, don't you? Our young people started us doing that. When we talk about the Bible, to read through the Bible, we clap and we rejoice together. It's pretty special when you can read God's Word. Verse 9. Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, If you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head. Now it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart Only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, No, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord." Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word, and you may be seated. The topic of my sermon this morning is, Oh, what a godly woman can do. When you read through 1 Samuel, it's like a river that begins as a bubbling brook, small. But it doesn't stay that way. It grows and grows. It's current becomes stronger and stronger until it empties into a river and then that river enters into a a mighty continental stream like the mighty Mississippi. It begins in Samuel with a simple prayer. And it continues through the sovereign will of God to grow and grow to the point where King David himself is anointed king over Israel and Judah. God took David from a simple shepherd boy and made him a king. It all started. Everything started. Think about this. It all started with a simple prayer. Prayed by a godly woman. Ladies, don't you ever think that your prayers are small, unheard, insignificant, without power. God can take your prayers and move a nation. Samuel is one of the greatest leaders in all of Israel's history. Uh, The writer of Hebrews mentions Samuel In the the 11th chapter, verses 32 through 34, I want you to hear this verse, these verses. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, 
quench the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became might, mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. And then after that, six more verses build upon that, talking about the mighty power of the faithful who are obedient unto God. And it all starts with a simple prayer from a humble lady who loved God like a mighty river that begins small and builds and builds and builds. God's plan is like a brook. Listen to what it says in 1 Samuel about, about the boy Samuel, uh, Hannah's son, before he was called by God. Listen to what it says. Now the boy Samuel was ministering before Eli, and the word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. Now think about that. Before Hannah prayed, the word of God was rare. People lived their lives without a picture, a vision, a, a promise from God. But now, in just a few verses... In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, listen to what the Bible says. Thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. All Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. You get that? This young lad, born to a godly woman, born into a, Christ, a, a, a believer's household. Before he was born, no word from God. But after he was born, so powerful... God used him so that none of his words failed. You know what I thought about when I read those verses? Who's going to follow Billy Graham in this country? Who is God going to appoint? Could it be one around this little circle here this morning? Whom God might call? Or a circle somewhere where people pray? where people invest themselves and plant the seeds of God in their lives and those spring and sprout in order that the Word of God, the great brook, the great river of God's sovereignty would not fail, but would change the outlook of an entire nation. That's what we're looking for this morning. And it begins in the heart of godly women and godly fathers who pray. Charles Stanley, in his book, God is in Control, says this. We live in a world of questions. What does? Who knows? Why is? Fortunately, we also live in a world with the answer. A wise and all-knowing Father. That's a statement about God's sovereignty. That's a statement about God's power. Today's world does at times seem out of control. Uh, it's, it's hard to get a handle on what's going on and what's happening around us. But the book of 1 Samuel tells us and shows us when things are hectic and unpredictable, God is still in control. He is moving this world like a mighty river toward its destination. I'm grateful for that. Now I want you to know that God hears your prayers. That's the first point of my sermon. Oh my, what God can do with a godly woman. He hears our prayers. He hears your prayers. Everything in 1 Samuel 
concerning Israel's victories over the Philistines, the anointing of Saul as Israel's first king, the reclaiming of the Ark of the Covenant, David's rise to the throne begins with the prayers of Hannah. Hannah was loved by her husband, Elkanah. Bible says here in the first chapter that she got a double portion. Every time she went to church, she came prepared. Her husband provided and she was ready to lay it all on the altar for Christ. This week I heard um, a story about a man who um, approached a very lovely lady in a, in a grocery store, supermarket, and he said to her, I've lost my wife in this store. Would you speak to me for a minute or two? And uh, that kind of puzzled the lady, so she asked, why do you want me to talk to you? And he said, because every time I talk to a woman that looks as good as you do, my wife miraculously always appears out of nowhere. <laughs> well, every time Hannah went to church, Penina, her rival, also showed up and criticized her, put her down. How would you like that? Every time you come to church, somebody says something out of place. Somebody picks on you. Somebody does something that is disturbing. Would you keep on praying? The Bible says here in verse 7 of chapter 1, look at it. It happened year after year as often as she went up to the house of the Lord. In other words, Sunday wasn't the best day of the week. We've got a, we've got a slogan here at Grace Baptist Church. is that Sundays are great at grace. What about if Sunday for you was the worst? Would you keep on coming? Would you keep on praying? Would you keep on being diligent for the Lord? Hannah did every time. Uh, the word barren, I did a little work on that word this week. It means, it's really talking about a land that produces no crops. It produces no fruit. A barren, empty land. The prophet Joel used this word about God's punishment on Israel when he said in Joel chapter 2 verse 20, he said, but I will remove the northern army from you and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land. That's how Hannah felt when she went to church. She felt parched and desolate. On the other hand, Penina, her rival, benefited from the great blessing of God through her children. Penina always had a bigger offering to offer at the sacrifice than Hannah did. Even though her husband gave her a double portion, Penina always had more because the Lord had closed her womb. She was empty, the Bible says. You get that picture? When she went to church, she just didn't. She was just empty. She had nothing for which to look forward. And then it says in verse 6, look what it says in verse 6, her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her. Now this part right here. Because the Lord had closed her womb. Think about that. Every time she prayed, God seemed distant. God's ear seemed to be turned away because the Lord had closed her womb. Not only was she pestered by her rival Penina, but even God Himself seemed to be unconcerned about her situation. She was greatly distressed and the Bible says in verse 10, look at verse 10. She greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept 
bitterly. The word distress means to burn. It means to be kindled like a fire. In other words, she burned inside with her situation. I mean, she didn't, she didn't come to church smiling. Uh, she came to church dreading what was getting ready to happen. You know? Think about that just for a moment. Uh, she was torn inside. She had this burning ill will and at the same time guilt over the estrangement because the Lord, it seemed, had closed her womb. And she wondered why. What had she done that would provoke the Lord to not answer her prayer? Now I want you to look at what she did. She didn't pout. She didn't carry a grudge. I saw the sign, a sign on a church the other day on, out front. It said, the heaviest thing you can carry is a grudge. You ever had a grudge? She didn't carry a grudge against Penina. She did not lead a campaign to get even or to get back at her. The Bible says she wept bitterly and she prayed. Bitterly means to bewail or to mourn like at a funeral. It's like what Peter did after he denied the Lord three times. The Bible tells us that he went out and he wept bitterly. I have a nine-month-old grandson. And he has two kinds of cries. He has a cry when he's hungry. Or when he wants something. Or when he's upset. There's no tears in that cry. It's more uh, fussing. You know, you heard a cry like that, just fussing cry. Like, pay attention to me. You know, he'll cry out. Your kids do that. But then, <laughs> but then there's a cry when his heart's broken. There's a cry when you've hurt his feelings. And oh my goodness, that's not only a cry that's a sob. You know what a sob is, don't you? That's when your whole body cries. Everything gets into it and there's tears and there's snubbing. You know what snubbing is when you, when you, you know? And he'll hide his little face in his daddy's shoulder or in his mama's shoulder and he won't even look up. Takes him a while to even face anyone else because his heart is broken. That's what the Bible is talking about here. A burning need inside that causes you to bewail and travail before God and to pray Him to hear what you have to say. The other day when we got the news that our debt had been paid, that there was a gift, a donor that had written a check and paid our church's debt. We'd been praying for that, y'all. We'd been praying for it for, for weeks and weeks. And I could do nothing but cry and weep before God because He had heard our prayers. Do we pray for lost people weeping? You know, our theme verse over, say, over there says, Now those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. Do you weep over lost people? Do you weep over lost people in your family, lost people in your neighborhood, lost people around you at work, at school? Do you weep for the lost who are dying in their sins? Do, do we weep over our country? I mean, bitter travail over what is taking place in our land. Listen to me. We need to spend less time criticizing Washington and more time weeping before God for Him to bring revival to our country. And to our land. It could start this weekend in our own church. If we're earnest about it. 
if we're sincere about it, if we weep over it before God, what he could do through weeping prayers of his people. The Bible says we ought to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. I know because you've told me there are people in our congregation who are carrying heavy burdens, heavy loads, and they bring those with them to church Sunday after Sunday and we pray and we pray. We should weep and bear one another's burdens, the Bible says. Thus fulfilling the law of Christ and being the church that we need to be. You know what the Bible tells us Jesus did for you and me? The Bible says that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he walked a little further and he knelt there and poured out his burden before God. He he said, Father, if there is any other way, if there is any other way. The Bible says that his tears were as drops of blood. He wept over Israel. He wept over you. And he wept over me. Charles Stanley said, Prayer is surrender. Surrender to the will of God and cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but aligning my will to the will of God. That, um, I, I was reminded when, um, when I read that quote, Matthew and I, my oldest son, we were out fishing down at Bayless Creek. And uh, I threw my fishing lure over toward the side and I got that thing wrapped up in a brush, a, piece of, uh, a, a, a stick up that was over there on the shore. And so we used the trolling motor to get the boat over there so that I could get a hold of my fishing hook and unwrap it from the limb that it was, was uh, tangled in. And when I was working with it, the boat wouldn't be still. And I hooked that thing in my finger. Now there's nothing that will get your attention any faster than hooking your finger with a fish hook. And uh, Matthew thought, he was in the back of the boat, Matthew thought that I had gotten my fishing hook free from the tree So he fired the motor up and started to back the boat away from the shore. Well, I wound up in Lake Lanier, waist deep in Bayless Creek. I want to tell you, when you got pain in your finger and a fish hook stuck in there, you're going to to do whatever it takes to stay close, right? To stay close, to, to get out there where you know you can... Uh, count on a little relief, <laughs> right? <coughs> you know, the, the context of prayer is about our closeness to God. You know, I have a feeling that Hannah had such distress. This whole point I've, I've talked to you about this morning is about praying it through distress and pain and heartache. Praying it through. Sticking with it. Trusting God. That's what prayer is. It gets us closer to God, not God closer to us. Especially when there's pain. When there's weeping, bitter travail before God. Through prayer we find the comfort of getting close to Him. That's why we need one another. That's why we need this place. That's why we ought to give ourselves to one another and to prayer and to forget our inhibitions. And if it calls for weeping, bring on the Kleenex. Uh, Brother Larry goes down to Sam's and resupplies us from time to time. We need more boxes of Kleenex in our church because we're in travail for 
the needs that are around us. One other point I want to share with you this morning. Not only does God hear the prayers of godly women, but He honors the faith of godly women. Hannah's great faith is seen in her vow in verse 11. Look what she did. She made a vow and said to the Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me. Boy, underline that word, remember. God never forgets. In other words, she, she laid her prayer life around the, the character of God rather than the bitterness of her situation. She trusted God more for what He could do than her current setting of what uh, it felt like to be a barren woman before the Lord. You know what faith is? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And I translate that, this is, a, this is a Mike Williams version. Faith is trusting God no matter what. No matter what. You hold on to Him. Hannah gave her son away. Look at this, what she says here. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. Now that's faith. She gave him away before he was ever born. Before God ever had the opportunity to answer her prayer, she had already trusted him enough to give him unto the Lord. That word remember, I told you to underline. It means to recall or to bring to mind. It is about the character of God. I found this verse in Isaiah 49, 15 through 16. And I, I have to tell you, tears came to my eye when I read it. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Now this is what part I want you to remember. Isaiah 49, 15, 16. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. Now you've heard about the Lamb's book of life, right? Our, I mean, when we get to heaven, our name's going to be written in the Lamb's book of life, right? It's more intimate than that. Your name is written on the palm of His hand. According to the prophet here. He knows you that well. He loves you. He remembers you. He thinks about you. Your name is on. He's, he's got a mighty big hand, don't you think? To have all of our names written on his head. And those walls. It says those walls are ever before him. That's your situation. You know, a wall is something that encloses. A wall is a barrier. A wall is a protection. It, it, it encompasses Everything that is around you, it is a wall. And the Bible says that your walls, everything that encompasses your life, all the details of your, of your significance are known to Him. They are forever before Him. He knows your situation. He knows it. It's continually before Him. You don't have to pray and remind Him of what is. He already knows. My soul. He never forgets. His character is wrapped up in the fact that He knows you and He remembers you. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Here's where she really gets down to business about the character of God. Listen to what she says. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against mine enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. No rock like our God. God heard her and He remembered her. And He granted her petition. And she sings this glory song 
about the character, the sovereignty, the, the love, the heartbeat of God. A rock in times of trouble. Wow, what faith. The uh, Niagara Falls plummets 180 feet on the American side of the river at Horseshoe Falls. Have you ever been there? Seen that great natural wonder of the world? Before the falls, there are violent rapids, but up a little further, the currents smooth out and it's safe for boats to navigate. Uh, right before the Wellen River empties into the Niagara, there are great spans of the river that you can walk along. And as you walk along, there are signs posted down the river. And the signs are for the boaters, and they read this. Listen to what it says. Do you have an anchor? I mean, the falls right over here. Do you have an anchor? And then there's another question. Posted right underneath it. Do you know how to use it? It's one thing to have an anchor. It's another thing to use it when you need it. Right? Prayer is our anchor. Faith is our anchor. God is a rock. And we can depend upon Him because our names are written on His palm and He knows us, everything about us. He is our rock. And prayer is our opportunity to use it again and again and again. What are you praying about this morning? I mean, before you came to church, how did you pray? Did you pray with a great burden? Some of you did. Some of you, I know your burden. You've shared it with me. And I share your burden as well. If you don't know Christ Jesus as your Savior, if you never come to a point of faith where you've trusted Him and given your heart to Him, we invite you to do so this morning in order that you might make Him your own and He might save you. And the hope of eternal life will be yours. Now, I don't know, Christian, how this message may have touched your heart this morning. It may be a prayer for your family. It may be a prayer for a friend, a work associate, but somehow you need to come and you need to pour out before God. Today in this altar, just lay it on the altar for Him. Maybe you need to join this church today. You need to become a part of this family of God. What a glorious privilege it is to walk with Jesus day by day with the people of the Lord here at Grace Baptist Church. We invite you to come and respond however the Lord leads you today. You just may want to come up here and shake my hand and say, Praise Jesus, preacher. <laughs> you know, whatever the Lord moves you to do, you respond as He leads you today. Let's stand to our feet, expect God to work among us this morning.